Today we're going to talk about not only the decline in Bitcoin, but also in the stock market, bonds, and gold, because I think it's kind of interesting to talk about whether or not this decline in other asset classes is a positive or negative for cryptocurrencies. But before we continue, I'd like to acknowledge that it's been a while since I've last made a video. I've been fairly busy, some things related to the channel, other things just life in general. But if you want to keep up to date with me, make sure that you check out my Twitter. I tend to be a lot more active on there. I'm at truth underscore investor. I post there more frequently when I go MIA on the YouTube channel. So if you want to keep up to date with me and my content, make sure that you check out my Twitter. And then also, I'm finally on TradingView. So many of you have been asking me to come on here for a long time. So hopefully that improves your viewer experience. I know a number of you are probably celebrating right now. Let's go ahead and get into the video. 2018 has not been kind to Bitcoin. At the beginning of the year, we traded at around $14,000 before coming up to $17,000. And since then, all hell broke loose and price came all the way down from $17,000 to roughly $5,800 before finally bouncing back up as of recently. And this decline was over 60%. And if we go from the absolute peak back in December, it's an over 70% decline. Now, one thing I do want to point out, and this is something I actually got from Peter Schiff's podcast, is that the decline was slower than the rise up in the first place. Now, he mentions this as a negative, but I think you can also perceive it from a positive perspective as well, which we will discuss later in the video. But you can see here that from 17,000 down to 5,800 took roughly 31 days, whereas this move up from 5,500 to 20,000 took 25 days. So we actually moved faster to the upside, which is usually not the case with bubbles. Usually with bubbles, you move quicker to the downside. And so this is kind of interesting. Peter Schiff argues that we still have some catching up to do. In other words, it will fall even faster. I don't necessarily agree with that. And again, we'll talk about that later in the video. Now, there's a number of theories out there as to why prices began to decline. Some speculate that it is due to the possibility of China extending their ban to exchange-like services. Others attribute it to the possibility of a ban on cryptocurrencies in India or the FUD surrounding that particular event. Yet another group believes that prices are being manipulated by Wall Street through the use of cash shuttled futures offered by the CME Group and the Chicago Board's Option Exchange. And then we have less specific catalysts like the idea that January has historically been a bad month for cryptocurrencies. So basically we have a January effect in cryptocurrencies. And some argue that it is a coordinated result from several or all of these different catalysts. But the important detail to me at least is that there is no single catalyst that can definitively be defined as the reason for this fall. Unlike back in September here, if we zoom in a little bit, we know exactly why this happened. It was initially a ban on ICOs in China and then the subsequent ban on exchanges in China as well. So we know exactly why this price decline happened, but this particular one, there's no single catalyst that we can define for the reasoning. What this suggests to me is that prices were simply too inflated and only needed an excuse to decline. So what do I mean by this? I mean that everyone sort of knew that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies were overinflated at least most people, and yet despite this, they kept buying in just so they wouldn't miss out and to hopefully ride the wave a little bit longer. In other words, price was driven by the greater fool theory. And funny enough, this type of mentality is actually quite similar to what we saw with Ponzi schemes like BitConnect, where people were aware that it was a scam and invested in it anyway in hopes of profiting prior to the collapse. This is almost exactly what I'm doing when I invest in Bitcoin despite believing it to be a bubble. Now, it's obviously different in terms of investing in a bubble versus investing in a Ponzi scheme versus scam. I don't think on an ethical level they're the same thing, but on a psychological level they're actually quite similar, which I find interesting. Now that we see the momentum is definitively to the downside, the mirage has faded and many are panic selling. There's also another subcategory of sellers that I'd like to briefly talk about who are only selling for the possibility of buying in cheaper soon afterwards. In other words, they're trying to take advantage of the downward momentum 
in the same way that people were trying to take advantage of the upward momentum in the second half of 2017. And in fact, this is kind of like the opposite of the greater fool theory. In the greater fool theory, we're basically saying that we buy an asset that we believe to be overvalued in the hopes to selling it to somebody else at an even more overvalued price. Well, on the downside here, there are people that are selling Bitcoin even when they think that it's undervalued in the hopes of buying for an even more undervalued price in the future. So that's something that's worth noting. That has contributed to this crash as well, and it's not all just panic selling. So this combined with the much louder voice of naysayers has led to a heavily bearish tone for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Just as we saw Bitcoiners drown out many naysayers while price was skyrocketing, suddenly the so to speak no coiners or whatever you want to call them are beginning to drown out the Bitcoiners. All markets are about balance. I mean, the, one of the first things we talk about when it comes to price discovery is the equilibrium of supply and demand. And what we are seeing here is the pendulum is starting to shift the other way as we are seeing sentiment on cryptocurrencies become a little bit more bearish as the people who were initially bearish on them are getting louder as price vindicates their opinion. Although obviously this bounce back is starting to quiet them down a little bit as well. Meanwhile, the past two weeks have not been kind to stocks. The S&P 500 declined over 10% since January 26th, although so far today has been a little bit more positive. And the Dow dropped over 1,000 points on February 5th, 1,175 points to be exact, the most it has ever dropped in history on an absolute level. Now, I want to be clear and say that it has dropped more on a percentage level in the past, but on an absolute level, this is the most it's ever fallen. Now, we did see this nice little recovery here, if you can see this green candle, uh, the following day. But the rest of the week so far has been shaky. The VIX is much higher. For those of you that are unfamiliar with what the VIX is, this is a measurement of volatility in the stock market. And it sort of has this separate name, this nickname that people call it the fear index. And that's probably the best way to understand it as a layman. It is a measurement of fear in the market. And one of the narratives throughout 2017 is that we had exceptionally low volatility. I mean, very, very low volatility. But we finally have seen a spike in volatility here. We haven't seen volatility this high since Trump won the election back in 2016. And so really, this has been a change in what's going on in the market. A lot of people are speculating and trying to understand why this decline in the stock market happened, blaming a number of factors such as inflation expectations, increasing interest rates, government deficits that never seem to end, and possibly most importantly, high frequency trading and algorithmic trading. A lot of people are speculating due to the large bets placed on continued low volatility, people who made the bets back here, in the stock markets, as well as automatic portfolio rebalancing, there was a significant sell-off caused by that automatic trading once we saw that spike in the VIX. In addition to that, we saw the market move below its 50-day moving average as well as its 100-day moving average, which is a critical support level that basically I think a lot of bots were able to spot and respond to accordingly. And to really emphasize this, if we go back throughout 2017, you can really see how many times the stock market bounced off of that 50-day and 100-day moving average. So this is the first time in a while that we've convincingly moved below the 100-day moving average and are starting to look like possibly starting to want to test that 200-day moving average. But regardless of the cause, the frothy stock markets are finally starting to see a decline after not only record prices but also exceptionally high valuations as measured by Schiller P.E. ratio. Meanwhile, the bond bubble has finally started to deflate, as in the past month we've seen Treasury yields really start to increase. For those of you unfamiliar, there's an inverse relationship between bond prices and interest rates, so when interest rates move up, bond prices start to move down. Given that interest rates have been so low, bonds have been considered to be a bubble, but since September here, you can see that we've really seen a huge move up in interest rates, but especially since the start of 2018, which has been a very important narrative when it comes to why people speculate 
that the stock market is starting to fall. There's less cheap money out there, which means there's less potential for growth for a lot of different companies. We did see bond prices recover a little bit, this little red candle here, when the market initially fell back on Monday of this week. But since then, the prices have come back down. So really, there was this risk off trade, but now it seems like everything's falling in tandem altogether. And lastly here we want to talk about gold because gold initially was holding fairly strong it's starting to move to the downside a little bit here but it has held stronger than any other asset class has really illustrated that it's more stable and i think this also illustrates why gold is well gold and bitcoin is not digital gold it's far too volatile when we look at bitcoin here and it's not yet perceived unanimously as a hedge against not only geopolitical risk but more importantly, and I think this is really what gold is all about, monetary and systemic risk. So look those two up if you haven't seen those before, if you don't know what those terms mean, because that's really what gold's all about. And Bitcoin doesn't tend to move in tandem with those particular risks. So Peter Schiff is starting to have a field day with this, as well as other gold bugs, because they're finally receiving a little bit of validation for their controversial views. Although personally, I think they're a little bit too extreme overall. But it does seem like some of their narratives are starting to play out. So this leads us to the very important question. What should you do in these markets as an investor? Is this broader sell-off in many different asset classes an opportunity or a positive for Bitcoin? Well, unfortunately, I tend to think that it likely isn't. What used to be a unique opportunity for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies alone, as we watched it fall like this, is now an opportunity in other asset classes as well, because basically all of them are coming down. We're seeing the stock market come down, we're seeing bonds come down, and we're seeing even gold come down, which is kind of odd when you think about it. But across the board, we are seeing everything come down. So there's now competition for where to buy the dip. Do you buy it in Bitcoin? Do you buy it in the stock market? Do you buy it in bonds? Do you buy it in gold? You can invest in all of these different places cheaper than you would have been able to just you know a couple of days ago. So that's something that's worth noting here. I don't think it's necessarily a positive. The other important part to note is that the recent sell-off was clearly a risk-off trade as we saw equities broadly sell off across the world and defensive stocks actually outperformed other sectors and bonds saw a slight uptick initially of course since then bond prices have come back down but initially this was very much a risk off trade and we saw a flight to safety where bond prices actually started to come up which is something that is worth noting if investors are going more risk off this would imply that there's less capital for bitcoin because obviously it's the most risky of all of these different assets now there is one last question that I know that many of you might be asking and that is whether or not the sell-off in stocks is related to Bitcoin. And I'm going to have to go with a big fat no on that because there's far too many variables at play here when it comes to stocks in particular, actual factors associated with monetary risk, geopolitical risk, uh, economy risk, so on and so forth. I just made up that last one. But basically, there's all of these different risks associated with stocks that have nothing to do with Bitcoin. I think the likelihood that these two are related is basically zero. Um, well, maybe not zero, but much less than people expect it to be, or a lot less than some people are speculating that it is. So I'm going to have to go with no on that particular question. So if you followed my content for a while, you know that I bought my last batch of Bitcoin at roughly $8,300 or so, and I have no plans to sell. You also know that I used the majority of the cash I have allocated to cryptocurrencies when Bitcoin reached that level. And I do want to emphasize here that I'm saying cash that I have allocated to cryptocurrencies in particular, not cash spread out within my entire portfolio. So I will be shifting some funds from outside of my cryptocurrency portfolio if we see Bitcoin go below 5,000, which is no longer seeming like that's going to happen given this bounce back. But if we do see Bitcoin come down to 5,000, I'm probably not going to buy it until it gets to that point. Now, the reason I'm not buying until 5,000 is because I'm fully allocated at this stage in Bitcoin and really only want to increase that allocation in the event that there is an exceptionally attractive buy opportunity. I want to emphasize that if I didn't have a position in Bitcoin right now, I would have been buying it below 8,000. I would have been buying it at 7,000, 6,000, and then it came a little bit below 6,000. I would have been buying it every $1,000.
The only reason I didn't is because my portfolio is fully allocated in Bitcoin. So this is a portfolio specific decision. And I want to put emphasis on that because different portfolios should make different investment decisions. And I know this is a tough concept for many of you to understand who are new to investing. But the best way to manage risk in a volatile asset like Bitcoin is to just limit your exposure to it and occasionally take profits when good opportunities arise. This way, when we see 60% plus declines like this, you don't get devastated entirely. Your portfolio doesn't completely lose all of its value. The flip side, of course, is that you won't make as much money when prices go up. But behavioral finance has illustrated to us time and time again that the pain of a loss is twice as painful or twice as bad as the good feelings associated with a gain. So I think it's much more important to limit your losses rather than to maximize your gains. Now, my current strategy is to identify altcoins that depreciate against Bitcoin and then move some of my existing Bitcoin position over into those altcoins. In other words, I'm not dedicating new capital to the market anymore but I'm just moving around existing capital. And I'd also like to note that all coins held up exceptionally well during this particular crash with Bitcoin dominance here never actually going above 40%. And this is kind of a harsh blow to my estimate that Bitcoin dominance would come back up to 50% in the coming months. I have previously stated numerous times on this channel that dominance tends to rise either during extreme crashes or extreme spikes for Bitcoin. And while we did see dominance start to see a slight uptick from 33% to around 38 to 39%, it never even came close to my estimate of 45 to 50%. And I think this relatively small altcoin sell-off, as measured by a rotation into Bitcoin, this dominance here, I think it's still a topic I'm really trying to form some opinions about, trying to figure out, am I wrong about my opinion that dominance is going to come back up? Or is it some other reasons? And right now I'm leaning toward the idea that it suggests that the overall market wasn't as panicked as the sell-off might have implied. And I think this is also supported by the fact that in general, this sell-off was slower than the market came up in the first place. Now, Peter Schiff used that as a bearish tone. I actually think it implies a more bullish thing. It suggests this was a very orderly decline. It was a much needed correction but it wasn't an all-out panic selling like we saw on this. This was panic buying. And the extremity of the panic buying was actually much more than the panic selling. And this is only part of the picture here. We're only looking at Bitcoin and not altcoins as well. So I actually think that we didn't see as much panic selling as many think, which might be the reason for why dominance was able to hold up so well. Obviously, there's other explanations as well, such as the recent news that Bittrex recently announced that they will be allowing USD deposits on their platform at some point in the future, allowing direct trading for altcoins and hence hurting one of Bitcoin's primary use cases. There's also the common explanation that Bitcoin is worse than useless, using one of Andreas's phrases there due to its speed and transaction cost, meaning that its time of dominance has come to an end. I'm still kind of wary of this idea because it fails to acknowledge that most altcoins aren't all that useful either. And then more importantly, possibly, is the fact that they really haven't been tested at the same scale as Bitcoin yet, both from an actual use standpoint, but also from a security standpoint as well. You know, you think about the fact that government agencies and corporations all have an interest in Bitcoin, where that really isn't the case with altcoins as well. So I think that's kind of interesting and worth noting. And I think it's going to take a longer time horizon to prove either side of this argument correct. As to where the market goes from here, it's anyone's guess as to whether or not the bottom is in. There are a number of signs that this is a positive recovery. Most importantly, the fact that volume was fairly high when we saw this bounce back in Bitcoin. Of course, volume has sort of become a little bit more tepid as we have moved from capitulation into consolidation. I still stand by my original thoughts that the end of the bubble is not here yet. Many investors missed out on this crazy bull run last year, and I think Bitcoin is now on their radars, and I suspect this group of investors is going to be the source of the next rise up in Bitcoin before we see a more real and extended bear market for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And of course, that's assuming that their utility 
improvement does not increase in speed because right now it's fairly lackluster the pace it's going at so what are your thoughts on this market I'd be very interested in hearing what you have to say as usual I hope you all enjoyed this video make sure that you check out my steam if you're interested in interacting with me I tend to post a little bit more frequently on there simply because the number of comments is more manageable and there's also a fiscal incentive for both you and I to post on the platform otherwise as usual Make sure that you leave a like, comment, and subscription. Hit the notification icon, and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you for watching.